Hello, hello. From the beginning. And I was shown that um, uh, that Lucifer would return, that the UN and the Vatican were going to be completely behind it, again, under false pretenses. He's going to show up and say, I'm here to save the day, right? Uh, and okay, fine, you know. Yeah, of course, ahead, you can try. say whatever you want. But I've always hated censorship. It's the internet. Sometimes, you know, once they get you for your first love bite, well, it depends on how aware you are, right? First of all, as you know, the, uh, the Anunnaki and the Draco are enemies. Second of all, underneath Baghdad was a stargate that was created by the Anunnaki so that they could transfer from Jupiter to the Earth. Practitioners that you know some are are good and some use their magic for good and to heal and to help and others do use it for evil and you know in some cases you know people really were. <laughs> This is too much sometimes. From the broken ruins of Babylon, this is End of Days Radio. I am your host, Daniel, broadcasting all the way to you from the shimmering Emerald City, right here in the Pacific Northwest, in the heart of the Pacific Northwest, I'm sorry. The date is August 14th, 2017. Our guest today is Mary Gabriel. Mary has a degree in humanities in 1990. She got a degree in humanities in 1990 from Brigham Young University when she began, when she began receiving messages. These dreams and messages were insistent that she find the chosen and initiate, in quotes, the great gathering. At that time, she had been directing a private school for young children. As her own ideas were expanding, she was eager to find a way to share the concepts of magic and the great variety of world cultures with children. She began to produce a children's magazine called The Little Folk. The magazine was intended to share metaphysical ideas with kids and successfully combine her love for childhood education with evolving spiritual principles. Mary's dreams continued, and in 2008, she launched The Immortals Project to reach the kind of people she'd seen in the early visions. For several years, she's worked to develop her ideas about what the gathering would look like. It was clear that such a project would need to provide an interactive and comprehensive spiritual network to succeed. With the birth, with the birth of the Modern Masters Project, the ideas pertaining to the gathering have found a spectacular home. Through the implementation of current technology and by having a core team committed to bringing the project alive, the dreams Mary had so long ago can finally emerge as part of a viable and valuable project. What an introduction, right? And my apologies for sounding like a first grader that can barely read there. <laughs> kind of stuttered a few times. Let's go ahead and give Mary a call. We're running a little late. Hello, Mary. Hi. I do apologize. I accidentally called you on Skype. I'm just going to go ahead and hang up real quick and dial the phone number you gave me. Okay. I think it might be better for the background noise. My dogs are kind of causing confusion. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry about running into so many errors today. I'll call you right back. No problem.
Okay, sorry about that, everybody. You know, this show is going so haywire today, and I don't even know why. It's just like everything that can go wrong, that can possibly go wrong, is going wrong today, and I have no idea why. First, my, first I had to restart my computer, then something else weird happened, and it is just going very strangely. So I'm just punching in this number so we can get a little bit of a better connection to Mary, and of course I will probably, probably uh, edit all of this nonsense out when, let's see, 769, oh god, this is just the worst today. <laughs> okay, 60. Oops, don't want to say her number on the, on air. Hello? Hello, Mary? Yes. There you are, finally. Yes, is the sound okay on this phone? Yeah, it sounds fantastic. Welcome to the end of days. Well, good. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And the first thing I like to do starting off these interviews is just ask if there's anything new going on in your world that you would like to start off by sharing. Well, we're just uh, doing a lot of work over here. I think you found me through um, Modern Masters. So that project is, we're going full blast on it, and it's busy, busy days. <laughs> that's about all that's happening on my end right now is work. A lot of hard work. I definitely have respect for that. You tend to get what you put in. Yes. Yeah, it's fun, though. It's good to be creating something that my heart is into so much. So that's good. That is good to hear. And I do want to really get the full story here, uh, how this all started, what inspired you. But let me let me go ahead and start off by asking a little bit about your origin. Where are you from and, and what was it like growing up there? Well, I was born in Pasadena, California. So um, I lived in the Southern California area. We moved out of the uh, Pasadena area <clears throat> or downtown when I was about eight over to the coast. And I really enjoyed growing up there. I had a spell that we moved to New Mexico, a small town, um, for three years. And that was eye-opening. And then we moved back to California. And I graduated high school there and started at USC. Um, so, you know, I just kind of had a, uh, city girl's background for the most part. Um, I was an only child and had really supportive parents and, uh, you know, um, gosh, in, in, lots of things happened even when I was young with intuition and dreams. I think it ran in my family a little bit. And so, you know, the interest in these kinds of unusual things started very early for me and was um, I was supported, you know, in anything I wanted to investigate in my childhood. So I had a really, I was blessed with a very happy, supportive household, and uh, I, I'm really thankful for that. I did struggle with some health issues, but again, you know, it, it passed, and I'm still here, and <laughs> so, so that's kind of a quick summary. <laughs> It sounds like your parents were really supportive. A lot of households, they a lot of households, they really wouldn't allow anything that's that could be construed as uh, anti-Christian. Uh, were you were you your parents religious at all growing up? Well, my mother had a, a Mormon background, and uh, my father, though, he wasn't very religious. He was a very good man and and had a good set of ethics and very upbeat, optimistic, but he was more secular and into education. Um, and so I had a nice blend. I did attend the Mormon church as I grew up, but I I ended up um, separating off from that in my 30s, and that was kind of my own journey. I think it would have happened no matter what religion I was raised in because I think I had to um, develop my own path. Uh, I think it was, you know, part of my calling here to do that. So I don't, I didn't leave um, the church with any animosity, really. It was more of just needing to explore without being dictated to or um, have any intermediaries between me and divinity. Uh, the, the, and I did a lot of study in those 10 years. I, I read and read and read. I have about 4,000 books and I must have read 10 books a week in some 
points there. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, really, that's a lot of reading. I kind of, I did. And I followed my draws. You know, I re- it started, um, it's the, it, those are the years that I discovered so much um, in with regards to magic and the history of magic and world religions and um, metaphysics and things like that. Was there a first so, sort of thing that you got into? Uh, I, I know that I, at some point you you began to become interested in magic. Was that the first thing, or was it like were you into space or dinosaurs or something like that? <laughs> oh, let's see. Well, as a child, um, yeah, I was really into fairies and these other realms, and it might have been partly because being an only child, I was just constantly lonely. I just begged for siblings and it couldn't it couldn't be uh due to some health issues with my mom so i just had a house full of friends all the time and when they left I was so lonely and i lived a lot with books and imaginative realms and uh so my my childhood interests really leaned towards other beings i think um and then i had i started with psychic experiences very early so I remember by the time I was 11 and 12, I was <laughs> putting my friends through these torturous ESP <laughs> experiment things, and we were trying to summon ghosts, and I guess I just always had some of this interest, um, you know, along with I, I did my schoolwork and did well in school, and I, I liked writing and things like that. So I had other interests, but uh, I think maybe this, this theme of uh, magical phenomena has been with me all along. Very interesting. And it's my understanding that following, following a high school or however that went, uh, you decided to get a degree in humanities. Why, why did that, why was that your path? Well, I started in so many different things. I actually started out as a math major. Um, because I wanted to go into architecture, and I married quite early, and as I started to think of having a family and everything, the um, math and chemistry routes were taking so much time on campus. They they had extensive lab um, and study groups and things, and I got where I wanted to be at home more, so I switched um, to something that I thought, you know, I considered English because I could do so much reading and writing away from campus, but it wasn't quite full enough for me somehow. I, and when I discovered humanities, it incorporated the study of arts, cultures, architecture, and writing, and just I was just enamored with um, discovering these all the various cultures and the histories of them. And I guess, again, it overlapped into what I would go on to study on my own, um, you know, because in humanities you touch on the world religions and mythologies that are associated with different cultures. So it really fit the bill, you know. I also minored in philosophy. So those kinds of things led to, um, very smoothly into my natural interest to study more world magical traditions and things later. And when was it that you realized that the the youth were so important? Could it have been having a a father that was into education? Well, um, probably there was a strong... I went to a private school for a while myself when I was young and learned to read very early. (laughs) And it was... You know, my household really respected um, literacy and the ability to think for yourself, which comes a lot along with literacy. And when I had my own child and was looking for a a really good preschool for him, I kind of, um, I don't know, I'm sure they were there, but I just didn't find what I wanted. And by then I was starting to study gifted education. And I designed this curriculum for small children um, that was based on gifted education. Come to find out, you know, they excelled. They weren't coming in. And so I started a preschool, which grew into a private school. And I just always loved children. It was just a carryover from this 
entire childhood of wanting children around me, I guess. I And so um, I ran this school and we just did phenomenal things just because we I believed in it. I believed these kids could do things that others weren't asking of them. And they were so happy. It was never a high pressure situation. So it it really went well. And as my own kids left those early ages, I think I just kind of grew with them. I started a magazine for young children <clears throat> back when they were young. But then when they turned into teens, well, kind of before teens is when the dream started about the gathering. And I think the Modern Masters uh, blueprint came in about that time because it correlated with kind of the young people and the energy that the teenagers have. And now, of course, it's morphed into more of a young adult um, situation, although it can apply to anyone interested, of course. But I just, uh, I think that lifelong interest was there for educating children and caring about and, and seeing their magic that they have and how powerful it is before it's been you know, uh, squelched by society. And can you tell us, if you don't mind, a little bit of what it was like when you began to receive these messages? Sure. I had um, really been getting messages that didn't amount to very much all through my 20s. what they were doing, I think, was they were preparing me to learn how to listen and discern between those messages that were coming from maybe another source and my own imagination. And they were like precognitive messages or um, telepathic messages that kept getting validated and were coming true. So I... I think they built up for me into more and more complex sequences of events. And they were, by the time, like, I would start with one message and and then I'd get another one maybe a month or two later, some of these series of events spanned several months. And they just went beyond anything you could explain through coincidence. So this background of having these things happen to me, I think laid the groundwork for me to accept the visions that were going to come in. And even then I really struggled with them because they seemed a little too grandiose and a little hard to believe. Um, I'm the world's worst or best skeptic, however you want to say it. And I just, um, I believed them so strongly, and then within a few days, I'd go, that just can't be, just can't be. So I just kept sliding all over the place, even though I had such a background of these things, you know, being meaningful and coming true. So that's kind of what led me to, I want to say maybe I should write my timeline down and get it once and for all in front of me. But I would, I want to say maybe mid-30s is when um, that big gathering vision landed on me and so by then I had had a lot of things already happen and uh, it helped me listen and uh, first first before I say this uh, I'm saying this very respectfully when you first started receiving this these messages was there any fear or or doubts that you were feeling that the messages might be from um, perhaps a deceptive source or might be government technology or something like that No, although now in prior to the gathering dream, it started with a kind of a dream, which I trusted because I I couldn't even interfere with it mentally that much. Um, But prior to that, these other things I'm referring to, uh, they were really pretty organic and kind of small and spotty and you know, they'd come in waves. They didn't seem to have themes that any government manipulation would be interested in, except a few were connected to extraterrestrials, but not uh, hugely. I mean, I didn't actually at that time, I didn't have that much interest in the extraterrestrial phenomena. Um, So my interest has grown there. 
now that I'm becoming aware of so many ways they they can connect with us and maybe I've had more experiences with them since then but don't think I don't think I ever feared the government as a source or any mind control I did have some things that were very dark that happened and that elicited a lot of fear um at the at the moment those were happening and I'm just going to call them evil. I mean, I know there's a trend sometimes to deny that evil exists, but there's no other there's no other word that really describes a couple things that happened to me and and I I recognize that energy after those happened. So, I did have some fears that would surface depending on what was happening to me, but at the t- but I never um I never worried about what you're what you're talking about now later in the process of getting people together and learning more about what was really going on with the government which I didn't really start learning until my later 30s then my phone was tapped and my you know world opened up to the realization about all kinds of conspiracies and mm. and what what the cabal and the globalists are really capable of yeah, that's that's uh of course that's sad to hear that your phone was tapped, but given that you are become well you're you're very involved in these fringe topics, it, it it just tends to happen to people that are into this sort of stuff, unfortunately. It was very odd because I wasn't in a position of any power. It was in the very early days of the internet. I wasn't even on the internet. Um, but I met a man who was ex-CIA, and of course, now that I know more about all this, you know, I realize he was never really an ex-anything, and I, I don't quite know how it happened, but I think it was through my connection to him that I got on their radar, because I shared a lot with him about this project, so... I may have never, it's not like in today's world where unfortunately now I'm hearing all about this censorship that's happening with alternative media truths and stuff. It's pretty scary. So it's not like in today's world where you could be, I would have been easily tracked just in general. Um, So I think it was definitely through the connection to him that brought that on to my, into my world, into my life. And so, yeah, I'm very aware of what, how deep the problem goes. <laughs> and now that we've we've kind of learned how things came together, what exactly is the gathering? Well, it's it it kind of boils down to the idea that there were going to be now so this started about twenty years ago for me and it it was a kind of annou- an announcement, like this massive visionary experience that these children were being born and were going to be born in the next 20 years that we're going to change the world because they were coming in with um, magic again, although it wasn't announced through the, the word magic wasn't really used at that point in time, but they were coming in with spiritual gifts and a spiritual lineage that was called to change the world. So in other words, it wasn't like ordinary, well, none of us are ordinary, but it wasn't like um, maybe the past generations. Um, it was, these were very specific kids being that were going to be born that now that I know more, could it be explained maybe through DNA manipulation or hybrids with superior races or, you know, a soul lineage where, uh, spiritual gifts are running stronger. Um, so it was this group that was going to be born, and they needed to be gathered together. And it had a lot of um, overtones of protecting them uh, from things like the government. Uh, and gosh, I didn't even tell anyone about it for months because of my own doubts that it was anything to pay attention to, but also because there was the heaviness about the danger the people would be in and the children would be in if it was discovered, if they were discovered because of the way the cabal doesn't want to lose their power. So they were very 
so this vision incorporated a lot of different things, but it communicated to me that we needed an extra kind of power to really do this. And that part of the reason the globalists have not been taken down or we haven't been, we really haven't had a chance to reshape the world is because we didn't have a group aligned for that purpose with the powers they would need to do it. So does that make sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I've heard, I've heard rumblings. I, I'm very into UFOs and conspiracies and stuff like that. And it, it's my understanding that children, that the types of children that you work with, they, like you said, they are sought out in some way by these Illuminati or whatever they are in order to, I don't know, recruit them or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, they're not, so many are not children any longer. I think, uh, you know, when you have these strong dreams and strong visions, you feel like it's just going to happen right now. Oh, wow, wake up and do something because it's going to happen next week and you have to get going. And one thing I've learned about these things is the timing is very hard to interpret <clears throat> when it comes to prophecy of any kind. And because there's no time, that maybe no linear time elements from the source of, this, of these dreams, um, they feel urgent and they feel like they're going to happen tomorrow. Well, here we are 20 years later with it really just unfolding now. Um, and so I, I'd have to say that a, a lot of the people I saw in these visions are between 20 and 40 years old now. And, of course, young children being born all the time. Yeah, it, it reminds me a little bit of the, the X-Men comic books, the, uh, the professor that finds the gifted young people and gives them a chance to explore and develop their powers without uh, going crazy and turning to the dark side or anything like that. I know, that's so true. I remember seeing those movies after I had this, <clears throat> you know, vision, and I remember thinking, this is a lot like these ideas. And and I know people have worried. I get comments sometimes on a YouTube or on a Facebook. She's just working for the government. Don't give her any information. Don't join her group. She wants to round you all up. Why would she care about doing this? So it's on people's minds, uh, you know, this kind of this archetypal uh, X-Men thing. Um, people now have this younger generation are really familiar with that. And it's very true, too. Um, but anyway, I don't have a role in that. From I'm, you know, I'm not linked with anything but me and my own heart on this. Um, the only thing is we do worry about security on behalf of the people. So my son, John, who's doing the, all the technical work and the sites, he's really being particular as he can about security. He won't even let us run Google Analytics because he said it's, you know, too easily tracking people and all kinds of things. So, oh geez, I have that. <laughs> Pardon? I, oh, I said, oh geez, I have that. That worries me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He won't. He won't let us do it. I, there's no perfect security, really, in this world. Um, you know, unfortunately, Wi-Fi routers are pretty much hacked. You know, by the government anytime they want, and, and we can't have perfection there. But it always has been a concern for me to be careful. And um, I know that people are very cautious. And especially the more unusual or powerful their gifts, the more cautious they have to be, of course. You know, they can't just go around announcing those things. And let's say that I have a child that I might suspect has certain gifts for whatever reason. How would I go about getting in, getting my child involved with the program? Well, right now the program, the Modern Master site is is more adult. It's not, it's probably not going to satisfy children right now. Um, there's a lot of reading and there's, it's text-based and there's a lot of questing that you have to do that's introspective and more meditative as well as some physical things. So I would say it's going to appeal more to like 14-year-olds and up, unless a, a very precocious 10-year-old uh, finds us or something. So we're not really, um, it's not really focused on children right now. 
um, we might at some point add uh, a children's division and definitely communicate to parents um, how to recognize things. But the but to for right now to send a child directly to the site, it's probably not going to hold their attention, or it's just not designed with that young of ages in mind. Um, so we would probably, like I say, communicate more, open up an entire division uh, in the future for children and for parents wanting to work with their kids. And what is meta reality? Well, meta reality is a term that we came up with because Modern Masters um, is designed in such a way that it can produce, once it's fully fleshed out and functioning and has a sizable membership, it can produce an alternative society. It's, we have an entire virtual world grouping system and a real world grouping system. According to people's uh, kind of soul magic and their interests, and so we can reshape uh, how communities are formed, and this can be like an overlay over the existing reality. So um, it could be very powerful, and we came up with meta-reality because it incorporates this alternate reality space that can really exist, as well as focusing on the invisible forces that individuals can work with to better their own lives and to better the world. So it's a step beyond um, the, our current reality, and it does incorporate maybe the be- people's beliefs in not only can they shape and create their own individual realities, but as a group we can create a new reality. Have Has technology like smartphones made our reality more meta? Well, you know, smartphones and the Internet, I think what they have done is enabled our reality to be highly connected. Um, I, I think it is a transitional type of evolution for our world that has happened because of the Internet and smartphones. But I wouldn't necessarily put it into meta-reality. Possibly, I mean, at a lower level of scientific advancement, the wireless technology, you know, could be, would be considered magic if you could win 100 years back and had never seen such an idea. So, or maybe 150. So, it could be considered meta if you went there, but I think for us, we're all used to this technology, so it doesn't really resonate to the word magic to us. We need to take more steps in order to really classify something as meta. Like if we went into the future, and maybe the John Teeter story about people coming back into our time from the future, that would be more meta reality, because we're already used to our current technology working, and we understand the science behind it. So meta implies that we have to push the envelope. We have to go beyond what we have right now. Um, So if you were back in time, we'd be living in a meta reality (laughs) because this wouldn't be something that would easily be imagined as possible. And it's my understanding that you incorporate things like massive multiplayer games and even games like StarCraft. StarCraft is actually my favorite video game of all time. How do these how do games like this help? Well, StarCraft is a strategy game. Then you have your three Ds like World of Warcraft and those and <clears throat> puzzle games, um like and the portal games. Then you have desktops, RPGs. There's some wonderful clips on YouTube and stuff from TED Talks of various people talking about the gamification um, as it applies to educating. 
And there's some great value in gaming techniques that we're trying to employ. So um, you have, we want people motivated, self-motivated, you know, but enjoying and kind of something that keeps pulling them back to do. And it creates motivation like a game does. And then the MMOs that have a really nice social element, that also is something we're trying to incorporate, is some virtual ways to create alternate uh, communities for yourself that you create just like you would on Second Life or something. Um, There's lots of gaming, like uh, the idea of questing, for example. Now, strategy with StarCraft, that would probably come in later when, you know, when we take over the world. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That would, that would, those kind of tactics and things would come into play more um, when we have groups established and see they will be able to, you know, name their nations and, and create their own mottos or flags and banners and their own statements that define their constitutions and things like that. And, we would like to see this trickle down into the real world. So we want to have this metaphysical bridge between our virtual world, modern masters creates, and the effect it could have on the real world. And that's where you might get into more, uh, you know, Eve Online or StarCraft's different, but, you know, Civilization Five, things like that. Now, we are not a 3D game, so we... Got, you know, we have to be careful saying gaming when there's two problems. Gamers come expecting it to be fast moving, highly engaging, um, you know, instant rewards, instant social and stuff like that, which will build, I think, as time goes on, there will be more things put into the system and it will feel more and more that way. However, it's more like someone studying magic right now. It's more like a training um program that has these elements of entertainment in it to make it smoother and more fun to go through than it is in a highly addictive game setting right now so we we might disappoint gamers that are expecting something we're not yet we do have an ARG element and we want to develop that more and more as time goes on but again um we're we're work, we're a team, a small team right now. And we're trying to satisfy so many needs that I hopefully in the future that gets to be stronger and stronger because I think the ARG elements could affect um, people's minds and paradigms uh, about reality better than anything. So that's the gamer side. Then you have the people who are coming to us because they really hear this calling. They hear a talk I've given or a video, and they know they're one of these the quote the chosen. You know they know they are, and they're interested in not only developing their own magic and discovering their own version of magic, but they're very interested in contributing back to the world and helping the whole human race evolve. Well, what happens to them is when they go there, and we might use the word game, it disappoints them because they're looking for something very serious and very meaty. So we're we're going to be redesigning the the landing page, and we keep trying to word this in such a way that we get across the point that we're using gaming techniques, but we're very serious about the underlying principles inside this program, that it's not for entertainment. It is for world-changing things, you know, to bring about these events I foresaw many years ago. What is what is the main thing holding back our normal educative institutions? I hear so many people, and I've even felt this way myself at times, where they refer to school as a prison or they refer to it as babysitting what would you say is the main issue with the current way that schools are structured? Well, it depends how big you want to go out and look at the picture. If you want to look at details, um, and from a, coming from teaching in private schools and running my own private school, one of the details that I feel is 
really critical is the class classes are too large. So if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, um, we taught all of our kids. Uh, we let them progress individually. So you have to have a small teacher to student ratio to be able to do that. The teacher has to have enough time to spend with each child and tracking each child needs to be done. So in reading, writing, and arithmetic, we handled everything individually. With things like social studies and group things and, you know, history lessons and things, it was a class effort. Well, you just can't. So we were producing kids that were scoring up to five years ahead on their SATs. Um, easily, just from the kind of attention they were getting and the ability to move forward at their own pace. So part of, so if you want to get down to some really bottom line things, um, this, the child to teacher ratio is ridiculous in most situations. And then there's um, moving up the scale. It, when I went through teacher training uh, for a little bit, I couldn't even stand it. It's so affected by bureaucrats and uh, people who are, maybe they don't intend to, but they're holding kids back so badly. I, I couldn't even, I can't stand it. And there's so much red tape and there's so much that comes down from from the government to incorporate and everything that you just kind of lose this pure delight in learning and um that unfortunately, what happens is I hired all credentialed teachers for my school so we could become accredited, and I had to retrain all the teachers. Uh, they they had no mentality about going outside the box they had been trained in for five years. Um, we had a children come in, and one little boy came in, and he had been causing problems in his school, and his mother said, please just let him come. And he was in third grade. I said, I'm not equipped for third grade. We go through second grade. You know, I, and she said, just come. Just let him come. Just let him come. Put him in your highest class. Just, I said, all right, we'll try it. Well, he came in, and I didn't know where he was with regards to what he could do. So I just told his teacher, um, let's start here, second grade math book. Uh, all right. Well, I said, just go home and work through these tests. Give him the chapter test. Well, he worked through it in three weeks, four weeks. And she said, what do I do? He's done with this book. I said, well, give him the third grade book. And so she did, and he worked through that. And it took three more weeks. I, she said, what do I do? I said, well, give him the fourth grade book. I mean, how? why do I even have to answer this? Shouldn't it be common sense that we keep giving him where he can, what he can do? But the mentality of the trained teacher is to stay within confines that have been predetermined for them. It's crazy. So he finally finished through a fifth grade and stumbled a little when we started in sixth grade math. So that's where we went. Um, you know, it, to me, this wasn't, uh, I'm like, well, can't you figure this out? <laughs> the child is succeeding. Well, then he did the same with writing. Uh, she made an assignment to the class to write a, a one or two page essay about a backwards day. And he said, that's so stupid. I'm not going to do it. And she had to work with him. And finally she said, well, what can he, he said, can I do anything I want? She said, yeah, write something about backwards day. So he came in with a page that was completely mirror written. You had to hold it up to a mirror to read it. So what we were dealing with really was a genius and who was utterly bored in the system. So as soon as he came in and I had to train this teacher to let him be a genius. She couldn't comprehend it because in her training, you kept the whole class together. So you hit this university training level that unfortunately is also um, affecting uh, public school teacher mentality. So if you want to go a level above that, you're back to the cabal. You're back to the point where they don't want anyone thinking for themselves. So Everything that can be done to to dumb down kids, hold them back, uh, prevent literacy is being done. So that's filtering down through the entire system. So it just depends on where area do you want to concentrate on because the problem is really massive. It has to do with control.
yeah, I, I can only imagine that a, a population that is not only educated, but em- empowered by things like uh, the psychic sensitivities and, and magic would be incredibly dangerous to the control grid. Absolutely. And, you know, they do it. I mean, they give their kids every educational uh, advantage they can. They operate with occult, uh, you know, procedures all the time. Um, they understand the principles the metaphysical principles. So, you know, they're doing all this, but the rest of us aren't supposed to have access to that because that would challenge. That would be uh, not safe for them. <laughs> yeah, it it yeah. really is almost a little bit infuriating when you think about it, that their kids are, are kind of getting getting the real real reality and us poor people, our kids just have to go to the, you know, the babysitting academies. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, it's it's infuriating for sure. It's now, unfortunately, they're also doing cruel things to their children. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Um, they're not parents I would ever want to have, of course. But um, in the me, you know, in between those times, they they ensure that their kids get a completely different background than the masses. No, they, oh, go ahead. We don't need money to give our kids. The same thing. We need parents to know that it's possible. When I first started, I was teaching three-year-olds, you know, again, individually, completely, how to read. So if one child was taking a long time to learn his letters, that's fine. We just gave him rewards and hoorays and everything every time he learned a new letter. Another child in the same class was already reading. So we didn't pressure any child, and that should be clear, that I didn't believe in that. Everything was very happy and very upbeat and childlike as it should be for their childhood. But we emphasized skills of reading. And um, one time a mother came to me and said, well, what will I do? Because you're going to have, you know, so-and-so reading. And what will I do when she goes to kindergarten? She'll be ahead. And I was thinking, this is a sad state of affairs. Parents, she's asking the wrong question. Not how can I hold my kid back so she won't be ahead in kindergarten and it'll be a waste, but what's wrong with our kindergarten? (laughs) That's the question. I mean, why isn't she going to the school and saying, hey, something's wrong with you if you can't stay ahead of my five-year-old? You know, it's like crazy. So I was holding these little kind of town halls just to educate the parents that it was okay. Now, that's what we're fighting. And not only that, this was in of, of the prosperous part of town. These I had millionaires in my school. These were the chief of surgeons' kids. I mean, the, I, I, I couldn't even believe it. I couldn't believe that the parents who were so well-educated themselves and had money had to, I had to explain these kinds of things to them. So you can imagine countrywide what kind of mentality we have with our parents. So that's how strong this goes. This is... This has been worked on through the media and through manipulation and propaganda for many years. Now, these these messages that you've been getting, um, to me, I I believe it because these these messages were obviously cluing you into some very real things, which I which I'm sure that you discovered were real at a later date. Um, do you have any idea at all where they're coming from, what the source could possibly be? Yeah, good question. Oh, man, I wish I knew because I can tell you that I never felt a dark presence. Um, And probably at the time, I felt they were coming from a group I called the teachers. They would appear to me in dreams. And they would give me, they would give me either information or almost take me through training. And they never frightened me. Um, they were very humanoid, and they had visited me off and on since I was young. I couldn't control when they came. They came of their own accord. Um, and they were like to me spiritual beings, someone I could trust. Um, so at the time when I had the first dreams about it and would get 
kind of information, you know, pushed into my brain to think about, I would say that I had no fear that I felt maybe this was that group or a group with affinity to someone like that. Now, years have gone by and so much research has been done and people are having experiences worldwide with different sources of extra dimensional beings and extraterrestrial races. So now I'd be hard pressed to label who it is that was leading me through all this because there's so many choices now. Um, My explanation seems a little (laughs) generic (laughs) compared to people who know that they're channeling an Arcturian or something. I could never, I would never be able to pin that down unless I tried, I guess, to get that information. But it just, um, so I don't really have a specific name of people or group or anything. It just linked up to me in my mind with these beings I called the teachers. I had one uh, experience with the teachers, which can kind of illustrate why I trusted them. Um, I was in my late 20s and married at the time and had these two little boys I have and um, who are now grown. And they, I had a dream and they, it, it seemed like the dream was taking all night. I went to some kind of ruins. And it was very bright and white. And these teachers were there, and they were very white as well. In fact, I couldn't even see details about their faces because they were so glowy. And they took me through all these ruins and showed me things like this is where we did this, and this is where our rituals were done. This is where... We buried our dead. And I mean, and it just went on and on. I, I can't even remember what they could have filled the whole night up with. Well, it was so real, and I knew it was the teachers. So right as it started to fade, I was saying to them, please tell someone else. Please show someone else this so I'm, you know, I don't have to. It's just not my imagination that you were here. And they just said to me, it is done. And I woke up, and it was dark in the room, and everything was normal. Probably about 3 in the morning, quiet, everything quiet in the house. My husband laying beside me. And I thought, darn it, nothing's changed. And I, you know, I didn't say it out loud. I was being quiet and everything. And I turned to get up, go get a drink of water or something. And my husband, out of the blue, sound asleep, wakes up and grabs my arm and he said, I see it, Mary. I see the white. It's white everywhere. And I knew they had transferred the whole dream into him from when I said, please show someone else. Because the last thing as I was fading out of that dream was this light of white that I couldn't even look at. It was so bright. It just got brighter and brighter and brighter as they were going to go and leave. So... I had these things occurring, um, you know, all kinds of things like this. So they just became very meaningful to me, and I began, I could trust them. Earlier you mentioned that you were told that there could be some ET groups involved or, or something to that effect. What, do you, do you happen to know which ET groups might be involved or have any more information on that? I've been trying to research groups myself. Um, Again, too busy right now to get, I need to get more and more of this stuff done. Um, Just to see if I could get a feeling from what others are reporting about different ETs because there are so many talented channelers or I don't know if they're all channeling. Some It's more telepathic communication probably for most of them that are getting really great information about which groups are working with them. And I'm trying to pick up the vibe to see, is this our group? Is this our group? <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. I, I do feel an Arcturian presence, uh, but they feel very, that group that influences that's Arcturian feels very uh, scientific, if the word, if that word. They, they feel like engineers or something um, in my, in an archetypal kind of way. Um, and, 
we work with a group we're just referring to right now as the Guardians. And I think they come from mixed um, places. I, I don't have any sense that they're all, they would all be Arcturians or they would all be Pleiadians. I don't have any sense of that. They're um, kind of like a UN, you know, I mean, except a good one. Uh, <laughs> they're they're a, a group that is extra terrestrial that's working um, for the humans. And, you know, when we talk to them, Right now, we're using the Ouija board, and they um, allude to other groups like themselves that are working with different groups of people. So besides people who can identify a specific race, I think there's a lot of groups getting help from small groups of guardians that are trying to bring their projects into fruition. And that's about the closest I could give you right now. I don't. I just don't. Yeah, that's really oh, interesting oh. because, um, you know, just to uh, not, not to talk too much about myself, but this this radio program, I've said since the beginning that it was inspired by something else. Like there's some kind of force out there that's been pushing me to start the show and keep it going, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I can't put a label on it. I just I just say I've got friends in high places. That's right. Well, you're called to do this. I mean, that's what I believe. So I think that we not only get inspiration from extra dimensional beings, but we get it from our higher soul of ourselves. Uh, I think we have kind of an oversoul or, you know, a, a bigger part of ourselves that we're out of touch with most of the time that has a lot of our answers right there. So I, you know, we don't have to go outside of our own soul necessarily to achieve the miraculous or to feel called to do certain things. But I also believe definitely that groups that we can't see on a daily basis are helping us and surrounding us and inspiring us too. Mary, in your opinion, do we all have latent abilities? Yes. However, I <clears throat> feel that not everyone will, that it's not equal. And I don't mean that in the life of a soul, if it goes on and on and on, there may be equalizing that occurs at certain points because the evolution of the soul has reached advanced stages and then it's harder and harder to discern a smaller and smaller degrees of difference. But on our Earth planet right now, I think we have young souls and old souls just to make it easy, just to, everybody can understand this concept. So what I always say is we have people here who are like first graders and we have people who are like eighth graders and we have college students in soul ages. And so different things appeal to those different soul ages. And younger souls are more drawn to stay within the mainstream. They're more drawn to structure because they're like children in that they aren't prepared to create their own path yet. So they internally, they know this. And they will look to others for guidance on how to create a path. So a lot of times when we um, when we see someone who makes us frustrated because they can't see what we're, we can see, we're not always dealing with someone trying to be stubborn we may be dealing with someone that's not ready. Like you wouldn't walk into a first grader's class and say, here's your algebra lesson today, unless it were a very advanced first grade. You know, and nobody would get mad. We wouldn't be mad that the first grader is still working on learning how to add and subtract because we would know that's where they are. But on Earth, when we talk to other adults, there's an assumption that they can handle what we can handle. I don't believe that's the case. I don't think our soul lineages are equal. I don't think it has 
anything to do with race or eco economic background or anything like that. Nothing at all. It's it's the invisible part of us that I don't feel is equal. So when you say is it latent? Yes, because our human souls were remarkable we're a remarkable group and these powers are within all humans but they won't all activate they're not all ready they're all people are not ready to trigger and activate what they can and will do in the future that's how i would explain that so that's why we don't see it everywhere that's why we see different levels of ability why is Belief so important. Belief? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> this is interesting because I think in the long run, belief is important, but I don't know if it is in the short run. I had my one of my first experiences with magic, magic with the K on the end, real magic, was... Uh, something I wasn't even sure I believed in. But I, I followed a very tight prescription of, of a ritual to do. And I had phenomenal results with it. And even while I was doing the ritual, I didn't feel anything. In fact, my brain was probably saying, what the heck am I doing? This is ridiculous. But I was kind of at my wit's end, and I went for outside help. And I found a witch, and I got this thing to do, and by golly, I did it. And I remember thinking, was that just the stupidest thing that I did? I'm, I don't, what the heck? Well, it worked. And I think it worked not because I had any inherent power or because my belief was very strong, but there was something to the ritual. There was a tradition, and the words say, said, and the sound of the words that actually works in spite of my lack of belief. So um, we, there are probably very real forces that will appear to any of us, whether we believe in them or not. However, belief comes into being important if you want to control those forces. So, for example, uh, a tribal person who's never seen electricity won't doesn't necessarily say he can believe in it, but it's going to exist whether he believes in it or not. Well, all magical principles are the same. They're not waiting. They're not waiting around for us to believe in them. They already exist. So they will manifest in our lives whether we believe in them or not. Now, do you want to? The question becomes then, do you want to work with those energies? Do you want to pay the price to learn about them, work through them with them, let them work through you? So, And that, again, is not for everyone. It does require dedication, and it does require commitment to learning it. And um, so, but that's where belief comes in, because you can't, you won't take yourself through a program that requires commitment and dedication unless you believe in it. Do you guys practice any sort of meditation? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, Dana and John uh, absolutely do regular meditation. Mine's kind of sporadic. And I always call my meditation, I don't even know, I used to say, is it really meditation? I mean, I never sit cross-legged and chant or anything. Um, but there have been years where I was probably in an alpha state for two or three hours every day. So now that I know, know more about the purpose of what meditation quotes is, that was my version of meditating. And um, I, I still do it. Right now, I am, again, there's so much in the mundane world requiring me, my attention, that Unfortunately, I'm not shifting to my <laughs> my meditation zones like I should be. But uh, but yes, I know Dane and John do meditate regularly, and I can't define their version of meditation for them. I can only tell you about mine. And one thing I want to ask is, 
when you get involved in, in magic and and that that sort of power is unleashed inside of a person, is there any danger of perhaps a dark apprentice or, or somebody that takes the wrong path and, and uses this knowledge and uses this power for evil? Yes, I think so. In fact, unfortunately, when I had my initial visions, there were it was shown to me that some of the chosen would turn to the dark side, and I didn't have control over that. So um, lots of things happen when you open up to magic, but again, lots of things happen when you don't know about it either. You just don't know how what to label those things. People can be affected by evil. Um, and not even, and not know how to defend themselves against what's happening because they would not believe in quote magic or they wouldn't they wouldn't seek out someone that could help them because that's not true that can't be happening um so again i guess you have to ask yourself do you want the knowledge to deal with what could happen to you <laughs> or do you just want to yeah do you want to let let things happen and not know what they are when they do unfold um now so back to more directly to your question. If you do begin to practice magic, I think a couple different things happen. You do open yourself up to other realms because that's one of the purposes. You're you're inviting um, inspiration to come to you through other means than physical you are also attempting to move energies through spheres that you won't understand yet, which affects your body energy. Um, when you knock on the door and you open up a portal to realms you don't understand yet, you're absolutely <laughs> opening up to the possibility that the wrong type of person is going to answer that door, wrong type of entity. Uh, you also are opening up to depletion of your own life energies and life force without the knowledge of how to conserve that and channel it correctly. Um, and, you know, like the uh, Kabbalah practitioners, in old, in ancient days, they didn't even let their students start until they were in their mid-40s because they felt the soul had to rise through the personality before they were ready to handle the kind of forces that they would activate when they started studying. And then you have like the Indian traditions of the Kundalini rising, which can rise too fast and cause so much power to go up through the body that it can short circuit the human nervous system. So there are these things that can happen. However, most people, I think what happens is you kind of uh, explore according to your readiness in most cases. So you do have time to get ready for a bigger force coming at you because you'll be dealing with smaller fluctuations and smaller forces first. There are veils in place and there are natural sorts of blockages that can that just typically prevent um you're, you from short serving yourself. Uh, it's it's kind of unlikely, I think. But you do need to recognize that those possibilities exist, and I think that's part of the belief system you have to adopt. Is if good things can come from this, if I can create my reality, if I can manifest and manipulate energies, then yeah, I'm opening up to things that are the opposite of that. So I need that knowledge too. Uh, you know, second of all, besides that, this is maybe a little has religious overtones here, but I think there's some validity to this. And that is if you are intending to practice magic for for light reasons, you do kind of light yourself up like a little candle and the dark forces aren't going to be real happy about that. So not only do we have a physical cabal that's operating here, but we have an enormous shadow world of beings that are, of course, behind our human cabal that are also watching for those little sparks of light, you know, and uh, you could come under attack from other realms. So there are these two 
potential dangers. But that can happen to people not studying magic too. So I think it just depends if, I don't think those fears should keep someone from learning and practicing magical techniques. Um, You know, even abuse of power can happen with someone who's not magical. Uh, You could have someone who's not very magical accidentally get linked to dark forces in other realms, and they can have a lot of power that they don't even know they have. So there's all kinds of things that can exist, um, you know, that unfortunately are dark. Are you of the opinion that we are actually in some kind of great period of change, awakening, or some kind of transition? I think so. I would have answered completely yes 10 years ago. I'm going through some personal experiences with this phenomenon called the Mandela effect. And Uh (laughs) I've been, (laughs) is that bad? Uh, Not really. Um, It's just, it's, you're not the only one. Let's put it that way. Right, right. Um, Well, I didn't even know it even existed. This is a brand new discovery for me, but things were happening to me and uh, I don't even know how I found it. I know it's been around for years. I don't know. I just missed it. So this is kind of new for me. The last three months, maybe. I found it. I identified it. You know, I'm watching YouTube videos on it. Well, what's interesting is my interest in that phenomena is correlating with some messages we're receiving um, from the Guardians about timelines. And that is also correlating with some studying I've been doing for more like five years about parallel universes, multiverses, and how that is possibly the way we're creating reality versus a typical law of attraction approach. So I already have that background too. So what I'm thinking now and is that perhaps what is happening is has always been happening, and that is that groups of people, when thoughts align with large enough groups of people, they actually split off into a different timeline. I know it sounds crazy, but anyway, um, I'm now thinking that our awakening or even I think I'm beginning to see modern masters almost as an invitation to come with us into this better timeline. And um, it's a strange way. It's hard to even put into words this idea at this point. But I'm veering away from kind of the standard terminology associated with law of attraction and even with reality creation. And I think our junction points of splitting off or seeing points for human evolution might have more to do with something along the lines of the Mandela effect and timelines than I would have ever realized before. So I'm not sure we're staying on the same timeline or the same reality. Yeah. What you're saying is, is really striking a chord with me because as soon as you started to go into that, my mind started to think about the, uh, I suppose this would almost be like an, an anti or a reverse or an evil version of what you're doing would be the, the Montauk project. And and supposedly Mm -hmm. they're taking these gifted kids and and making them do all this strange and weird stuff. And they're trying to affect the timelines. Right. Right. And the CERN. Now I'm not blaming it on CERN. I, I don't have a cause in my mind yet. I've watched all kinds of videos and all kinds of theories about this Mandela effect. And we are going through a, the Schumann, vibrational resonance changes and of course I was reading years ago that the vibration of the earth would be speeding up and speeding up and now we're at these huge leaps in vibrational frequencies and who's to say other vibrational things aren't hitting us from space at the same time as earth and then we have a possible thinning of veils we have portals opening who said I couldn't tell you the cause you know I can't claim that it's CERN or anything like that. I just think it's happening. I don't understand yet why. So 
uh, that also influences the ability to create timelines. So let's say you had times on Earth that were more stable. It might be trickier to create different timelines because the vibrational frequencies were more were slower. Maybe atmosphere was or ether was more dense. It wasn't, you know. But we we may be actually moving into a time where timelines start splitting off all over the place or something, you know. Or um, I know there's the theory that it's a break, like timelines have actually merged, but they're falling inward and they're coalescing into one timeline. I don't know. That doesn't sit with me yet because I'm I'm having too many experiences where I'm thinking it's more the opposite, that the reason these these frequencies that are changing are actually enabling kind of the God creator to wake up in humans and create timelines. So when you ask about an awakening, it's getting more more of a complex question to me taking these this physics into account, you know. Um, it may not just be that we're all one clump of people uh, plodding along, you know, stuck in one reality together. It could be a lot more complex than that. Could some of this... Could could some of this phenomena, some of these abilities and things like that, you already touched on this a little bit, but could this be related to ancient aliens and the idea that perhaps at some point in the past, an alien group or multiple alien groups actually either bred with us humans or manipulated our DNA in some way? Oh, I completely believe that. I mean, I, 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 have no problem, for example, personally believing in a divine source like a god, and at the same time believing that we were we're just an alien race, because that to me those don't uh, contradict each other. To me, the universe is enormous. Uh, all races are creations of the god source, whatever. So, I also believe in the magical principle as above, so below. And look what we do on Earth, right? We have vacant lands and people in power who consider themselves superior. They go and they colonize those lands. Why wouldn't that occur in space? I mean, it's the most logical. You almost have to be anti-logical to think of another source for our beginnings. So to me, I completely believe that we were colonized and populated from extraterrestrial race races. and that. Um, I think the whole Anki, Anki, Anunnaki story um, makes sense. I think we did get somehow uh, linked up with some that aren't very good. And I think, again, we've got that bloodline of maybe reptilian, uh, you know, it gets labeled reptilian. There's probably a hundred bloodline races involved. But um, I think our cabal, I think our world, as far as it was going to function for the last 5,000 years, got hijacked by an extraterrestrial group of races that is negative. So that's another reason why I think we've got to work with extraterrestrial groups. We need their help because we're kind of in a war here. You know, I mean, we're we're under-equipped as a rule to deal with this. Could these so could these we be need the our own power and their power to help take our Earth back? You know, take take the human evolution back away from them, and really evolve to what we were, we could be. Could this negative alien group that you were saying hijacked us? Could this be the reptilian group that David Icke speaks about? I think that's as good a guess as any. I've followed David Icke for many years, many years way back when they were laughing at him and he just started. Um, and now, you know, everybody's talking about reptilian. So um, we have Simon Parks, who claims to be half manted and half reptilian. And um, it could, yeah, I mean, I personally can't report an experience with reptilians. So I'm just going on how much I choose to believe from others that I hear. Um, but I think that's entirely likely. You know, they may... 
we may have reptilians, but we might have five to ten other races that are also working with the reptilians that really don't care about the humans as a whole and are negative. And they and yet the reptilians may be wearing the dominant face or something. So I I wouldn't know. I just there isn't been anything that's been revealed to me to share, you know. I'm kind of in the dark as everyone else is. But I can accept that it's true. I'm perfectly willing to to blame that until I know of something different because other, you know, David Icke has a lot of uh, documentation from people all around the world who have, who do swear they have feelings and interaction with reptilians. How do you feel about, how do you feel about remote viewing? Is it real? Well, I think so. Um, I went to a remote viewing seminar years ago. But, you know, I've read uh, the books of the people who were trained for the military and watched these. Uh, I'm kind of astounded by how much we can do. That um, I've been listening to someone lately, and he's saying, like, it hasn't been hidden from us. People keep saying it has, but really it's all out in the open. Well, I don't. I have to agree with him in one way. Magic hasn't been hidden from us. In today's world, we can access so many things and so much information. But I think the problem is that it's a brainwashing thing that's been done again. It's a propaganda movement that that's silly. You know, I mean, just worldwide in the Western world, for example, Western, let's clarify, uh, first world countries that are ruled by the cabal, that are ruled by aliens that aren't really for us, have, you know, really made fun of magic and of telepathic abilities, um, astral travel abilities, remote viewing. All this has been made fun of and ridiculed. And this massive brainwashing took place over, you know, 200 years that we can relate to, okay? So <laughs> um, I think that's what we're dealing with. Not so much that we can't access it, but most people don't even want to access it. You know, the, the, the fear of being accused that they're in, interested in some fringe area is just, they just don't want to deal with that, you know. And it's not something they can see working. You can't light a fire and heat your food over it. They, it can't control it that easily. And so it's just as easily pushed aside for most people. But I think it's absolutely real. And uh, what I have had happen, going to a couple little seminars and things, just following the the guides, you know, that's up there leading the group, doing what they say. I've had confirmation that it works, you know, things like this work, and I'm not even practiced. I mean, if we can tap into it that easily, imagine what we could do with practice. So, uh, and I, so I definitely believe remote viewing is exists and is being done, and it's still being done by the government. <laughs> or I don't even know if I can call this a government anymore. Um, but definitely through channels that are controlled through the globalists, all psi phenomena is being developed and- because they know it's real. They they have black you know they brainwashed the masses that it's not real but they they know darn well it's real. And how about telepathy or communication between two minds? Absolutely, I've had too many experiences myself. I know that's real, and I think that can be developed because way back that those stories I was telling you when I was forcing my friends to do these things. I mean, we were just little kids fooling around with it, and we got better and better at it. So this is absolutely available to every human, everyone, but not everyone will do it. So it will never, it won't, in this timeline that this world is on right now, it's going to be tricky to implement these abilities. Uh, It could take hundreds of years. If we shift to a different timeline with a group of people willing to accept these things, it could go much faster. And but it's absolutely possible. Telepathy is not, not a problem. And we are having a lot of telepathy with 
extra dimensional dimension uh, beings right now and extraterrestrial beings right now. So that's why there's this plethora of information, you know, just pouring into the internet. Mary, I know that you are a very busy person and, and you're working very hard on your on your project here. But what about the off time? Do you have any like hobbies or TV shows that you really love or anything like that? That uh, any any personal hobbies or anything like that? Well, you know, I <clears throat> have some real. I've had some health issues the last ten years that have really been kind of challenging for like physical stuff. Um, so now I'm do, I'm doing better because I've moved and the air where I have a respiratory issue and the air where I'm li- living is so much better. Um, so I'm not in, too much into sports or outdoor activities right now, but I need to get myself out there and walking and doing more like that. So. Uh, off times for me right now is I have a puppy and that should say it all. <laughs> I have this maniac dog. Um, anyway, I've got these other dogs <laughs> and then I got this puppy and she's kind of full time. And then, uh, so on my downtime, I'm usually very guilty of watching YouTube, get more information about what's going on from other people's viewpoints. Or I watch TV. I admit it. I'm I've been hooked on tons of series. I'm Netflixing it, you know, every night. <laughs> so I did my years and years of reading. So I'm kind of enjoying uh, the visual of YouTube and television right now. <laughs> awesome. And unfortunately, we are hitting the bottom of the hour, and we're approaching the end of our interview. But I wanted to just go ahead and open up things one more time for you. If you'd like to get on the soapbox and just say whatever you'd like to my listeners out there, go ahead and do that. And feel free to follow that up with anything at all that you would like to promote or plug. Well, all right. I just want to invite anyone that um, I want you to, I want people to know how close to my heart this invitation really is because I've lived with it for 20 years and I just sincerely would invite anyone that feels a resonance on any level to the things we've been talking about and maybe being a part of a different timeline and um, investigating what we're doing at Modern Masters and communicating with me or John or Dana um, because for me, I'm I, the, my whole life's dedicated to finding you, and that's it. It's not more complex than that. There's no real hidden agendas. I've lived with my calling for so many years, and I've done it in spurts and stops and starts, but it's always in my heart, and I feel very genuine about it. So any anyone that has questions or wants to speak, to leap aboard and I'm afraid we're going to have some growing pains and we're going slow, but we're dedicated. If you could hang with us, I think you're one of the ones that we're supposed to meet. And I feel that very honestly. So um, you could go to modernmasters.org and you can do a great deal for free. When we implement our groups and begin to do our alternative society, we will be having a membership charge. Um, but feel free to also, uh, I'm I'm on Facebook at Immortals Project. I think it's just it's either The Immortals Project or Immortals Project. Um, on there, and that you could, if you message me through there, we could start conversations just on a personal level. I'm happy to do that. So either through ModernMasters.org or through Facebook, and you can. I think my email's listed right on Facebook. So. I'd just like to start, I just want, whoops, sorry, I'd just like people to know how how sincerely I have been searching for you um, because the magic's going to come through you and through you aligning with each other, and I, I really feel that in my heart. All right. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much for being involved in this in this very important work that you're doing and thank you so much for joining me here on end of days radio and i'd love to touch bases with you again in the future and and maybe see where you're at and have you on again 
Well, that'd be great. Thank you, Daniel. I'm glad you found me, and I was very happy to be on. I loved the conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And until then, you have a great day. You too. Thanks. Bye. And there you have it. That was Mary Gabriel from the Modern Masters Project. Very important work that she is doing. And I, I highly recommend that if you are one of these young people or perhaps you know somebody that has some sort of abilities or might not fit in due to reasons of being a little too special, I highly recommend that you contact her. I think it's, is it modernmasters.com? Let me Google that really quick and make sure we do the proper plugs for that since I'm telling people to go there. Yeah, it's just, uh, nope, that's a oxidization thing. Okay, that's a business. Let's see. I And I know that this this show can be very unprofessional sometimes, but who cares? People that complain about stuff like that, come on, get real. There's more important things going on in this world right now than me being a perfect radio host or anything like that. Come on. It's not about radio. It's about this freaking whatever the hell's going on. There's crazy shit going on. Anyways, that website is modernmasters.org, not com. It's .org. So modernmasters.org. And this is kind of a weird day because, as some of you may know, we've got two interviews going on today. I'm going to be joined by Stan Deo in about 15 minutes, 15 minutes. So I do have some stuff to talk about, but I have to take a break. So I have to kind of pick what I'm going to talk about right now. And I think I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about psychic abilities. Since we were just talking to Mary Gabriel, I, I'm of the belief that psychic abilities are very real. And this is because I've experienced, experienced phenomena many times myself. Uh, unfortunately, the first times that it happened were when I was experimenting with certain things when I was young and in my party years. That's kind of how I discovered a lot of strangeness that's out there. But I do agree 100% that if you really want to make it happen, you have to practice. And it can be really frustrating at first because you probably aren't going to get results right away, especially if you don't believe that it's possible. That belief can really hold you back. But what I want you all to do out there is I want you to practice just a little bit every day. I want you to try moving a pencil with your mind and practice some telekinesis. Maybe Crumple up a little ball of paper and see if you can make it move. Try to use your imagination and blend it to what blend it into what's in front of you and will it to move. Or you could try communicating with other humans and you can organize experiments where you and another person think about each other and try to send messages. That's a couple ways. Or you could just try to read people's minds out on the street. That's a little invasive. I hope that you use ethics while you're practicing these types of things, but by all means, practice, 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 practice. This is real. It's not fake. It's not comic book stuff. It's not the movies. This is reality. And if you really want to, if you really want to prove to yourself that these things exist, really the best way is to practice and also practice opening your mind and practice practice believing that it's real because the more you can do that the quicker it's going to happen so i think that's enough for now and i have plenty more stuff to talk about after our second interview but i'm gonna need a little bit of a break in between so everybody enjoy the let's see here should i just i guess i should play some music boy um let's see here you guys want to listen to some alice in wonderland yeah, of you people that hate electronic music, you're just going to be mad as hell, but... Hello, and welcome back to the end of days. This is your host, Daniel, coming at you in 4D. I did want to come back briefly before we start 
the second half of our show. It's actually going to be released as two different shows, so I'm going to play replay the intro and everything. So uh, my apologies to you guys out there that are listening live and are having to put up with all my fumbling today. But I did want to come back and just do one more thing in regards to this show with Mary Gabriel. I wanted to go ahead and do our mind-blowing moment of the day. So let me let me grab my new little toy here. All right, so I bought a tambourine for this segment, and I'm going to do this. Yeah! Mind-blowing moment of the day. Mind-blowing... Oh, my God. I might have to reconsider this. That was super annoying. <laughs> this thing's loud. Very loud. Okay, so the mind-blowing moment of today is when... Mary told us about the body's energies and kundalini and stuff like that. I, I think that that really struck a chord with me because it made me realize that this woman is very clued in. She definitely knows what she's talking about. Uh, that's something that people, for the most part, they don't even talk about. They don't even know what it is. They don't know what it's about. But the fact that she's linking these things together shows me that she knows exactly what she's talking about. And she is definitely on the right track. And wh- whoever is giving her this information, wherever it's coming from, it's it's absolutely uh, it's absolutely a positive thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit our outro, and then actually I don't need to hit our outro. That's not necessary. I'm gonna I'm going to uh, pause for a second, and then yeah, why don't I play the outro? You guys love the outro, so I'll play the outro, and then I will start everything up again. Crazy, huh? But that's what we're doing. The king has returned from the broken ruins. Back. 